going to do is we're going to have a discussion uh, uh, very intro level about the world of sync so that uh, we build up to a point where we can answer some of your questions that that so many of you sent in um, and try to uh, end this 75 minute session with everybody leaving with understanding the basics of synchronization and the kinds of things that you might need to do to get your songs placed um, in in television, film, advertising, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so welcome, Michelle. I'm very Thank excited you. for you to be here. Um, uh, right before we we get into our discussion, I, I know everybody always wants to know a little bit about the journey of the person um, who's our guest today. So if you wouldn't mind in just a few minutes, give us a little bit about your journey. I know you're a New Yorker like me, um, but now you're in LA. So, so tell us a little bit about that. Okay, great. So I'll do it in a New York minute. My husband says I talk too fast, but hopefully I won't. So I am from New York City. I grew up there. I always wanted to make music. Since I'm a tiny little girl, all I wanted to do was sing and be involved in music. I've never questioned what I wanted to do, and I'm so proud to do it. I moved, I had a band when I was in high school, like so many people did, right? We all started as creators, most of us as singers, pretty much everybody who's a songwriter, a professional produ music producer, like I am, started out wanting to sing, wanting to perform. So I have the same normal trajectory. I played in bands. I moved from college, I moved to Tucson, Arizona, where there was an amazing music scene. And I lasted in college for five minutes because I joined the band and went on the road and we played all over the Southwest. And I learned all about live gigging and band booking and all that kind of kind of stuff. And then I moved to Los Angeles in 1980 with 57, 81 with $57 because I had lost my plane ticket, I had $157. That's all I had, I had nothing. Came here to explore the dream, only then realizing I was in New York City and I really could have done it there, but I was always headed for California and not really thinking New York was a mecca of music. So I came here to California, also put together a band. I did performance art. It was absolutely bizarre, weird, strange. I had people hanging from the ceiling, uh, polishing their nails and reciting poetry while I sang. And one song I rocked in an old lady rocking chair and, and was knitting this thing that I've never finished knitting, but I was always knitting it. And I just, I had actors on stage, films, slideshows. It was very intense performance art. And I thought that was touching people until somebody compared me to Madonna because I was sick and I have terrible bronchitis and probably through this, you'll start hearing me clearing my throat, I have terrible bronchitis. And I, I was not well that day. And I got a huge write up from Craig Hilburn in the Los Angeles Times, who's like the biggest right. writer who said, oh my God, she does do what she does. She's this performance artist, singer, songwriter, produces all this stuff, really amazing. And her voice sounds like Madonna. And I cried for hours and hours and hours because I wanted to be Bjork, who didn't exist then, but I did not want to be Madonna. But it was at that moment that I realized Madonna touches people. I was touching two people and Madonna was touching two million people in her popness. And I started changing my mentality a teeny bit. And then I was really floundering around from between 81 and 87, and I was doing my crazy performance stuff. I was a waitress. I you know, didn't have a penny to my name, but yet I was always making music and every penny I made, I spent on paying musicians, paying for studio time, paying for everything. I learned how to produce early on and all my music now from then is being licensed. That's how I had learned to produce and it sounded good. And we're gonna, as Susan said, discuss about that. It's, it, my music already had sound, sounded great enough that people still now want to use my music from 1980. So that was how I learned um, producing. In 1987, I had a friend who was making a movie 
and he needed songs. And he had done, he was a director and he had actually made the slideshows and the films with me for my production performance art. So he knew what I did and he asked me for R&B songs for Sam Moore from Sam and Dave, who if anybody be old enough, he did, I'm the soul man, you know, and hold on, I'm coming. So he did those songs and Junior Walker from Junior Walker of the All-Stars who starred in this movie called Tapeheads, John Cusack, Tim Robbins, all their first movies, they were in this. And he needed songs. He said, could I ask some of my friends? So I went and under a pseudonym wrote a song with my writing partner, who's still my writing partner. We've been writing partners 39 years. And we wrote a song, not one of my weird artsy things. And we wrote this R&B song and we got the song in the movie. So that would be so your first my scene. first. Not only was it my first sync, it was my first cut. So I got both at the same time, which is very rare, right? Because I was, had- Was there a soundtrack to this? Yeah, movie? on Island Records. Okay, so, so basically let's just, let's go back for everybody because mm -hmm. the basics. So basically what Michelle did there is she wrote a song that was going to be used in a synchronous way in the film. But at the same time, she needed a master recording of it because it was going to be included on the soundtrack album. So right there, she had two avenues of income coming in. Right there. Yeah, and song. the very famous uh, producer, guitarist, jazz guitarist, Paul Jackson Jr. actually produced the song. So that okay. on, the, on that first song. Yes, exactly. So I had two, I had different kinds of income. They paid me a synchronization master fee. I have gotten royalties on that song since 1988, since it was released. I still, every quarter, get money from that from that synchronization. And then I, I three, I, then I went to New York, back to New York. I was in Los Angeles, but Niall Rogers from Chic the Freak, who's on tour all the time. And I'm sure people know. By the way, Michelle, is. sorry to interrupt. What was the name of the song that, that you had your first sync? It's called That's Enough of This War Stuff. That's and enough it was of this war, war Stuff. stuff. Okay. Yes. Okay, um, great. So, so then, then Niall Rogers, my, my sister was friends with Niall Rogers and Niall invited me to New York to be mentored by him. And I went back to New York for a few years and he taught me so much about producing and endless things and hooked me up with everybody. And I was in sessions with him, with Diana Ross and Rod Stewart and all kinds of major artists. And I learned so, so much from him. And then the, at that same period, right in 1990, I got two big things because I got a song in another movie called, um, actually, yeah, Car 54, Where Are You? Which was a remake of that old TV show. And also with Sam Moore from Sam and Dave. And this one I got to produce. So in 1990, I got to produce my first major artist. And it was also a sync, which is very unusual that my first play, my first forays into music professionally were in synchronization, which wasn't even called sync. That then. is very it was unusual. Called, yeah, a music placement. Right. And then, and then in 1990 as well, I had my first hit song because now Rogers introduced me to his assistant, who introduced me to his roommate who then we all got connected to write a song for Bruce Garfield's artist. He was a big manager, still is, on Island Records, Misha Paris. And we wrote this song. Who I, by the way, was the publisher for. That's so her, awesome. You were you the publisher for, for Camus and Andreas? Um, she was, she had um, what, whatever pieces of songs that she contributed to Chapel um, covered. Uh, as, as the publisher. And we also had other cuts from other Chapel writers on her first record. Oh, and Misha's record, you mean? Yeah, oh, that's yeah. awesome. So this is not Misha's fir first album. This is Misha's second album, right. Contribution. And my song is called Contribution. And it's the title of the second album. And that's so cool. So Misha's amazing. And on that song of mine, Eric B and Rakeem rap. And it's one of the first ever hip hop songs, real hip hop songs where there's writing and singing on the, I mean, rapping right. and singing on the right. same song. Right. And so that was, I, that was my first big hit and first, you know, my third kind of cut, first big hit. And I got a publishing deal at Island Music. 
Okay. As well. so, yes. So let's let's just shift gears for just a minute or two um, to to start getting into the basics of sync. So as we go along yes. with your story, people um, have some tools to to use to decipher some of these things. So yes. you talked about that your first sync was uh, both a placement, and we're defining sync by the way as it's defined by the Copyright Act. Uh, section 106, um, the copyright owner has the right to create uh, a sound recording linked with an audio on film or tape, uh, sorry, linked with a visual on film or tape or any other visual medium. The copy, copyright law actually gives the copyright owner that right to decide how to do it, which basically means that they have the right to license their music to create this marriage or linkage of sound and visual, right? So in Michelle's case, her first, uh, her first big sync not only was a linkage of sound and visual, but she also created a sound recording um, of that as well. So what we have here is we have the two copyrights in music being used. So Michelle, I want you to go and talk about the two copyrights in music and how they're used in a sync situation. Right, so the two copyright rights are, they're the sync part and the master part. So basically when a song is created, it's like a pie. Half the pie is the writer's share, half the pie is the publisher's share. That never changes. There could be multiple writers, multiple publishers, but it's always 50-50 those two shares. That said, that is the synchronization portion. It belongs to the to the composition, to the copyright of the composition, which if you're filling out a copyright form in the US is called PA, it's the PA form. That's and the that, performing, and, that stands for performing arts, which is the, cop, the US copyright that covers the composition. Yes, and oh. the copyright belongs to the author on the copyright song form, the author being the composer, the songwriter. The copyright does not belong to the publisher. It belongs to the author of the song, the composer. The second kind of copyright is SR, the sound recording. The sound recording being the master, also called the master. And that is what is copywritten on for the second type of copyright. Now, one composition can have hundreds of sound recordings, different masters. Like Over the Rainbow, if you take something like Over the Rainbow, it's been recorded thousands of times. So every one of those is a sound recording but there's only one composition. So to me, that's the answer basically to that question. And in, in the case of a synchronization, hopefully we own the master if we're independent and we own our publishing as songwriters. And so then we are licensing the synchronization and the master use all together and we are able to do that. However, in the case with my first synchronizations, I did not own the masters. So I on my end could only license the synchronization portion, which is the composition, the writer publisher share, which I controlled. But those those masters were not under my control actually. So let's talk about that for a second. So um, just to recap, in a synchronization where you're linking sound with a visual, there are two copyrights. The first is the PA, the song copyright. The second is the SR, the recording copyright, the master recording. So the key here is you can't license a master recording unless you have permission to license the PA first because the song is the, is the primary copyright that must be licensed first, obviously, because you can't have a recording of it unless there's permission to use that song. So in the case of um, uh, a synchronization, Michelle, let's go back to what you were just saying. A songwriter and or publisher controls the PA. The next question we have to ask to the film company, the TV company, or the advertising company is, what recording of the song do they plan on using? Are they planning on using an existing master recording, right? Um, let's take this song Yesterday by the Beatles, right? You have, that's a Lennon and McCartney song. Are they planning on using the Beatles recording of it or another recording of it? Or are they planning on only licensing the PA and creating their own recording? Let's talk about that. 
Yeah, well, of course. Well, that turn, that's a cover song. So just a little advanced, I guess, but we'll discuss. So a lot of people make covers. I'm sure a lot of you in here do cover songs, maybe in your bands, your artists, you perform them, you record them. That's totally fine. Once a song has been released to the world, it's called a first mechanical, which really never happens anymore because everybody puts all their music on Spotify and on their websites. And so that everything is already released. Usually everything we pretty much create these days. Once we do that, anyone else can record our song. So that's how copyright works. But everybody can't just put a, use a song in synchronization because that is where we actually get a say as the music creators if we want someone else's version of our song used in a synchronization. So if I write a song and I love my recording, my SR copyright, my sound recording, and then Susan comes along and she does a re-record of it, a cover version, I might not want her to do that. And so I at least have the right to say no, I don't agree with cover versions of my songs and I'm not going to allow them to be used for synchronization. There are writers who are like that. I last year was music supervising a song and wanted to do a, a cover version of We Got the Beat, the Go-Go song. And as it turns out, the writer of that song does not like and approve covers for synchronization. They have to use the original Go-Go's recording. So I ended up doing the Go-Go song, Our Lips Are Sealed, where the two writers on that song love cover versions because they make more money and they don't, aren't so precious about the original Go-Go's recording. So when one wants to do something like that, one actually, actually has to find out who the music publishers are, contact the music publishers and try to get an idea of will it be allowed for them to use a cover version for synchronization. So to pitch it for a movie, for a TV show, for a game, for an ad, that type of a type of thing. So essentially what the, the point here is that in order for a sync to happen, the songwriter and or publisher must agree to the to allowing that particular copyright to be used in the first place. So you have to start with getting permission for the songwriter, because if the songwriter, or the PA owner doesn't give permission, it doesn't matter who owns a master recording of it, it can't be used. So you always want to go to the publisher first or the songwriter. If they're OK with a cover version, fine. Then you go to the master owner and you get a license to use that. So then you have both copyrights ready to go. So Michelle. Right, but if you're, if you're writing your own songs, which I'm assuming most of us in here, and I know so many people here write their own songs, then usually you would own your master with your co-writers maybe, with your, if your producers have some involvement, you know, we won't go too deep into that because that's all kinds of issues. But if right, you, but in if most you, cases, a record company owns a master, right? So unless you're well, your own but not company. not for independent artists, they no, own exactly. A That's what I mean. Yeah. Unless you're your own record company, yeah, right. Yeah, um, it's it's important to know, and this is our next topic. Once you you have um, the idea of the song that you want to license, what if, what other information must you have at hand? If you are the writer and someone's coming to you for permission or if you're a music supervisor and, and you're looking to get permission, what's the key information that you need to know? Okay, so great. So if, if we, the problem why music supervisors, we always hear when we watch webinars with bunches of music supervisors and they're saying we should get an agent, we should have somebody representing us. The reason why they don't wanna to come to us directly is because we lack knowledge. So when we learn knowledge, then we're much more valuable to these people that we want to send our music to because then they, are, they trust us. And so we're gonna discuss some of the things that we need to know right now to make them trust us so they're not afraid because we will learn the lingo and understand how to navigate the music business. So basically we need to know the basics of music publishing. We need to know what we were just discussing. What is a sync? What is a master? Okay, so now we know the sync is the composition, the writers and publishers share of the recording. The master is the sound recording. We need to know that. We need to know who wrote the song. And I know for some of you, you're gonna laugh and think, well, that's ridiculous. But I 
I actually know someone, she just spent three months in Sweden, wrote a 10 song album. I said, who are the writers she doesn't know? She doesn't know the names of the people she wrote the songs with. Okay, that's not good. We all have to know the names of the people that we write with. And we have to have a little split sheet. It's called the split sheet, a piece of paper that has our name, our, our address, our phone number, our email, what the share is we've decided that the song is split in. Hopefully it's equal split. So if there's two of us, it's 50-50. If it's three of us, it's in thirds. If it's four of us, it's in quarters. Hopefully it's equal. But if you have weird splits where someone got 10% and someone got 2%, that's okay, but you should have this all documented in writing that everybody signs because we need to know who wrote the songs because if not, we really can't send them out to pitch them for other ventures besides just having them in our iTunes catalog because we don't have any information. We also have to know who are the publishers of the songs. Now, as we said, right, the song is divided into two shares of writer and publisher share. So if you have no publishing deal, then you are the publisher. So whoever here, like me, I own my own publishing. I don't have a publisher and I am the publisher. So people always think, oh, I don't, there's no publisher. I'm just starting out. I don't know. There's always a publisher and you are the publisher. So now you have to have a publisher. Best that you register your songs at a performing rights organization. And most of the people I see here know this, but in case you don't, a performing rights organization, also called a PRO, is a place that collects money when songs are exploited in live performance, film, TV, uh, live uh, bowling alleys, arenas, if you perform at a gig, at a stage somewhere, Radio. Uh, streaming. So Any performance is, a, is what the PROs deal with. Any public performance. Yeah, but they may not know that, a, but it's not, a record sale is not a public performance. No, of so course then, Right, so, but they might not know that. So, so that's what I'm discussing. So, yeah, so any public performance, so you would want to join a, P, a performing rights society. Here in America, we have ASCAP, BMI, CSAC, GMR, and, uh, you know, there's people here I see from Germany where they have GEMA, and people here from Canada where they have SOCAN, and people here from Australia where they have APRA, and I'm seeing all these people, but there's a Performing Rights Society, you join it. This is like whiz whizzing through this stuff. And then you would have that on your split sheet with your co-writers as well, so you know. And, and if someone's not affiliated, you would put NA, they're not affiliated with a PRO yet. You would have all that information on your split sheet. That's really important to know who the right your co-writers are. Now, let me really? just, can I just interject because there's of course. an important point here that you made. So you made the point that when you are preparing to license your work for synchronization, it's really important, both as the licensor, the person giving permission to use the music, and for the licensee, the entity that wants to use the music, to know who the writers and publishers are. Because each writer and publisher has the right to reject the permission. So if you have a song that's written by two different people, if one writer wants to use the song in a McDonald's commercial and the other doesn't, then the song cannot be licensed because each writer has the right. So it's very important, as Michelle said, to get that split sheet with all the information so every writer who's involved in this particular copyright is acknowledged and can weigh in on whether this license should happen or not. Right, and in addition to that split sheet from what Susan just said, I have a, a piece of paper that I've drawn up that, and I do this before we write the song, just so you know. I, I, I have splits before I write the song to everyone, this is an equal shares. I don't care who wrote how many notes, who, who wrote how many words. No, this is equal splits. I write with lots of kids and, and their contribution is the story they tell. They might be not even contributing an actual line or a melody, but their story is the song. And so to me, it's always, so I do split sheet upfront. If you wanna write with me and get through my door, we are gonna agree upfront that it's equal. Then upfront, we are going to agree that we each can pitch the song. So like Susan was saying, 
you, we don't have a choice. We've agreed upfront, whatever it is, we are going to allow the other person to pitch for it and agree to it and sign off on it and give our information to the, the license for it. So I won't write with anybody who doesn't sign this paperwork upfront. So we already know we're not gonna have an issue about one person wanting the commercial and one person not wanting the commercial because we've already decided upfront when we're writing together, this is how it's gonna be. We're gonna write a song. It's gonna be, if I want Faith Hill to record it, if I want Beyonce to record it, if, if I want McDonald's, if you want you know, Taco Bell, none of us are gonna stop each other. We are going to agree upfront that we can exploit it's the word exploit is not that ugly. It's exploit, make the song use, use for anything. It's really important to do that because if not, like Susan's saying, you could have somebody not want to license this and that is not good. And that's why the music supervisors don't want to deal with us because they think we don't have all our ducks in a row and they are afraid that the, their powers that be because they have to serve people. Our, their producers and directors are gonna love this song <clears throat> and, they're all of, and then they're not gonna be able to use it because one stupid writer came out of the woodwork and goes, well, I don't want my song in a McDonald's commercial. So we, which, which happens though, because- It does. Do, you know, creators um, put a certain value on their music and also have certain ethical positions that they take um, where they won't let songs being, be used um, with various products or for various causes, et cetera, et cetera. And so writers- But that's why I have all the paperwork up front. So it doesn't but, happen but, to me, but right. yeah, uh, writers exactly. Writers have the right to say, mm -hmm. you know what? Um, I'm a vegetarian, so none of my music can be used for any product that, that advertises- Yeah, but we should do this up front. Exactly. Yeah, yeah. You should do this up front between us as writers. If somebody has a problem, I'm I'm a song whore. I don't really care. But if somebody, if I'm writing with someone and they tell me, okay, that's great. You can you can do that, but I just have to say I don't want tobacco ads or I don't want alcohol right. or, or I don't want meat. Okay, so we agree with that in writing up front. That's okay. You know, right. and, and if one or the other of us is okay with limitations, then we all just agree. Look. I've had producers call me wanting then when they were going to use my song saying, telling me, they didn't have to, but they were kindly telling me, you know, we're, I'm going to use it in this ad. Is that offensive for you? And this thing, or one of them actually called me to tell me they were going to say on camera, I don't like this song. One of the characters was going to say, I don't like this song. Was that okay with me? Right? So- exactly. Yeah. Um, so so I, I don't could care less, but you know, somebody else might care. Right. The main, the main point, point number one, is that in the world of sync, the most important thing you need to have ready is the information on who the songwriters and publishers are and uh, the splits on the song so that when that TV production company comes calling, all that information is ready. And as Michelle so saliently put it, everyone knows that there's not going to be a problem agreeing on whether this sync should happen, that there's an agreement that this sync should happen. So the next step is- Well, we also have to know who the master owners are. Right. And that's, that's another true. thing we yeah. have to have who documented, who owner. owns the sound recording. So, right. so everybody has to know that because just like this artist who didn't know who her collaborators were, she did not know who produced her songs. She didn't know who owned the master masters she didn't know if she paid for them did she own them did they own them she left these writing sessions knowing nothing so we have to know that information as well to be able to properly pitch our songs right so now we have we know who the songwriters are we know who owns the master let's take you know a scenario michelle and i have written a song we are the songwriters and we know who our publishers are and the song was recorded by Beyonce, who is on Columbia Records, right? So now we know who the master owner is, it's Columbia Records. So we have that information. The next question is, what are we looking for in terms of fees for the use of this song? In order to determine what the fee might be, what kind of information do we need to know, Michelle? So well, to determine what the fees are for the song, we don't really get the opportunity to determine. 
So if that's what you're asking, um, if the song, of course, is going to be recorded by an artist, then there's a statutory rate and we don't get money up front. So it's 9.1 cents in the US and in other countries, it's a percentage of the record. I'm sale. talking about let's, but let's for use saying, Beyonce recording. They're good. They want to use the Beyonce recording, but obviously they need our permission as the creators slash publishers to to get a license. So they're going to say to us, OK, we want to use the Beyonce recording. And for the PA, the songwriting copyright, we want to pay you $10,000. What should we know before we agree to that fee? Yes, well, the thing is, it's all about budget. So there are no standard fees. And let's actually discuss more that the songs they own rather than a major label. So, so you guys, you all have songs like me. I license songs I own all day. So I own the master, I own the sync. I don't have to worry about a Beyonce recording that's ridiculously expensive. They are going to most often, people who are going to want to sync my songs are going to give me the price. 95% of the time, they're actually gonna come and they're gonna to say to me, okay, I need the song, I love the song, I have no budget, my budget's depleted, I have $1,000, all in. All in meaning for the sync, for the master, I have $1,000. So there is no set fee for a TV show. It could be gratis. It could be free just for the for the back end royalties only, or it could be five thousand dollars or two thousand dollars or five hundred dollars. It's rarely ten thousand dollars. Maybe on a TV show max for regular use, about five thousand dollars is a good fee. Sometimes six. It's, it's, it's all gotten less and less. As the years have gone by, the prices have gone down and down and down because people who don't know anything, as we're learning a little bit here, give their music away. And so now all the prices have disintegrated. If it's for a film, sometimes the money might be higher, but sometimes not. And that, well, let's backtrack. On a TV show, the music supervisors get a budget. So every te television show, they usually get a music budget for the entire series. Let's say it's 10 episodes they have in the series. They get a music budget, X amount per episode. Some episodes might end up being music heavy because they need something special. So they might steal a little from another episode, but they need to spend the money. So a lot of songwriters get angry and they say, oh, well, the music supervisor doesn't want to pay me. They just wanted this, this. No, the music supervisor wants to spend all the money. Because if the music supervisor at the end of 10 episodes has money left, then the next season, their budget's going to get lowered. So they want to spend the money. They want to pay us as well as they can. And they're going to tell us most usually, I'm so sorry, Michelle, this is all I have, right? And usually we're going to agree. So that is where the budgets and the finances come in. From films, it's actually very different because a film has a bigger budget, but the problem is that most music, unless it's on camera, most music is put in in post-production, which is when the whole film has been shot and it's done, and now they're going to put in music. The problem with that is they've stolen off the music budget. In TV, they don't steal off the music budget because they have filming budgets from the networks. They're, they, they, they're, they're taken care of for the filming. But in a film, when they have a budget, they're stealing from music the whole film because they run out of music. They need more money for a different location. It rained one day and it set their production back. And whatever happened, they're always taking from the music. So the budgets can really vary. Music budgets on films are usually based on the budget of the film. So if the film is only $1 million, that's tiny, tiny. If the film budget is $80 million, that's really happy. And then we're gonna get more money for the uses of our music, even if they're new songs, even if they're songs I own, they don't have to be Beyonce songs. We still might get 10,000, 20,000 for use in a film that has a nice budget like 80 million. We might even get 25,000. But in a low budget film, like say that's a million dollars, we might get $500. And it might, we might have the same song in both films. And in one film, we got $10,000 and the other film, we got $500, right? So we, that's the problem is there are no set rates. Now in some countries, 
like in China, in Australia, where we were just watching a webinar, they have a rate card and they actually have specific set rates for these uses. But here in America, in Canada, and many countries in the world, it does not work that way where th there's no set rates. And so we can only judge. Today, I had a student bringing me a contract where they were actually asking him to quote a fee, which is very rare these days. But after he kind of, you know, pushed them and needled them around a little bit, they finally came back with, okay, this is really what we have, what we like. This is what we've done with other people. Can you do this? And so that's usually what happens because we don't want to tell them we want 5,000 and they only want 1,000 and then they go away and don't work with us. So I hope that kind of answers the, that question, Susan. I mean, you know, advertisements, well, you were discussing before the webinar, advertisements can be much more. Even a small brand new song can get 10,000, 50,000, 60,000 in an advertisement. A Beyonce song might get a million dollars for a use in a Walmart ad or something. So right. the so, money varies so much. Right, I would say, you know, a takeaway from what Michelle was talking about is that sync licensing fees are pretty much based on the free market. They're based on how, what, how the writer and copyright owner values the music and how important the music is to the producer of the film, the television show, or the uh, advertisement. If they really, you know, uh, producers and directors in films oftentimes uh, shoot a movie with a song in mind for a particular scene. They absolutely have to have satisfaction by the Rolling Stones. That's the song they need for this scene. They can't accept anything else. So when that happens, that obviously gives leverage to Mick and Keith and their publisher to ask for whatever fee they want because that's what the director needs for their for to, to realize their creative vision for that particular scene. So I think what Michelle is saying is fees vary based on the leverage of the copyright owner and the, the, the desire of the licensee for that particular usage. Um, but I've had a couple questions here in the chat related to, to what you're talking about. Um, and so I wanna kind of combine them. So um, let's go to pitching. Let's, let's assume now that, that somebody hasn't come to you to use a song that they know you control, but you want to pitch out to the various users and, and get them to know about your music and to get them to be interested in you as a songwriter so that they eventually will come to you for sync opportunities. Let's talk about the first thing that a, a creator and copyright owner, the first couple of things needs to do to get prepared to start pitching their work. Okay, great. So I suggest usually this for the first time. When you're watching TV, you know, TV is a bit, is an easier place to start than films because it's easier to find out what they might be interested in because the TV shows usually have a theme and there's types of music that they use. So the first thing you want to do is watch TV, is see some TV and think, oh, wow, I have some songs that might be, you never say would be great for, the music supervisors hate that, but some songs that say, uh, this might be cool for this show. Okay, so I want to think about that. Then I want to watch the credits. Let me see, is the music supervisor's name listed in the credits? Because that would be super cool. Then I could see who the music supervisor is. If not, there's great resources. There's a resource called IMDB. And for those of us who are aspiring to be professionals, I re recommend subscribing to the pro version, which I have all my students do. And it's called imdbpro.com. And you go there. Then when you search on that site, you will find the music supervisor. Maybe you saw their name or maybe you didn't see their name. So Grey's Anatomy, you're going to search Grey's Anatomy on IMDB. Bam, you're going to find the music supervisor by looking down all the filmmakers that are involved in the show and it's going to come up to music and you're going to see who the music supervisor is. Yay. Okay. Almost all music supervisors, like maybe 90% of them are listed in a directory called the Film and TV Guide. The Film and TV Guide is put out by this company called the Music Business Registry and a man named Rich Ezra, Rich with a T-R-I-T-C-H-E-S-R-A, 
Rich Ezra, who owns this company, and he makes these amazing directories that list A and R people. One lists the film and TV guy. There's a publisher's guide. There's a, law, a music lawyer's guide. Really fabulous. So you have the film and TV guide because you bought it in PDF form, and now you can found the name of the music supervisor. Now you can look in Rich, Rich's guide, and you can find the music supervisor's email address. So these are the basic ways to find somebody to pitch to. Now, if you want to know what kinds of music are on a certain TV show, there's also a website called TuneFind, T-U-N-E-F-I-N-D, TuneFind. And TuneFind lists gazillions of television shows, episode by episode, where you can hear snippets of the music, see what kind of music is on it. Sometimes they list who the music supervisor is. So these are basic the basic elements that we need for finding these people and for sending our songs. So if we have a song that we think is this kind of singer songwriter soft, everybody knows that, you know, Grey's Anatomy does, I, then we might want to send it to the music supervisor. I will say genre wise, the easiest songs to get placed are very happy, pop, up tempo, either hip hop or dance songs that are clean about inspiration and a beautiful day and life is great and I'm finding my way and aiming high and going for it because there are less of them. And the music supervisors always need that. Plus for advertisements, we're selling a product and we're not gonna sell a product with a slow sad song, our love song. So these songs are easier. And if you have those songs, you can find so many places for them. But these are the, that's the basics. I mean, I teach a 20 week course and teach all of this step by step over 20 weeks. So I'm just jamming a lot of information here into this. But this is the, this is the basic thing about, about pitching, Susan. So, okay, so let's I, assume I that we've identified who the music supervisor is for a particular TV show. And we think that we have some music that might work. Let's talk about uh, actually putting together your package to pitch. What do you need to do vis-a-vis -vis your songs, your recordings, your, um, your cover letter? Uh, is it a letter? Is it uh, an email with a link to MP3s? What's the best way to get to, to put your best foot forward when you're making that first approach to the music supervisor? Okay, great. So like the Nashville Songwriters Association, NSAI says as their slogan, it all begins with the song. You have to have a great song. Uh, is that subjective? It can be, but what goes along with a great song is a great production, right? Susan, we were discussing that before. So you and I, so the song has to be produced that sounds like a record. So if you have a song like Beyonce, it has to sound like Beyonce. It has to sound, if you were listening in a Spotify playlist to songs and your song was in the middle of all those songs on the Spotify playlist, it wouldn't stand out and sound bad. It would be as well recorded. So songs have to be what are called master quality. They have to be professionally recorded. They can't be a guitar vocal. They can't be a piano vocal. They can't be um, just you singing a cappella. They can't be you sending a lyric sheet. They can't be sounding where the vocals are not tuned, where the instruments aren't in tune, where everything is out of time and there's a cacophony of mess. The, the rep, they have to sound like records on the radio. They have to sound that good and better because our music is being used as a less expensive alternative to them using Beyonce or Katy Perry or, you know, Ludacris or whoever they're going to use. Our music has to sound that good. So it, that is what's not subjective is our instruments in tune. Are they in time? Is everything in the same key? Those things are not subjective. So you, if, if one does not know what something master quality sounds like, that's totally okay, but then one should find someone who does and seek them out, maybe at a school, maybe someone at She Is The Music who can mentor you, somebody who can help listen to your songs and help you make sure, because you don't wanna send a sub quality song. Like I was saying, I learned how to do this very early, how to produce, and 
my songs sounded great. That's why they got placed. If they didn't sound great, they would not get placed. So you don't want to be burning bridges by like making friends with a music supervisor or getting contact with them. And then you send them a song that sounds horrible, right? Can I just jump in here for a second? Because you yes. have a really good point that I want you to elaborate on a little bit. So you're talking about that the quality of the recordings have to be master quality. They have to sound finished, professional, and, the, and it's a great song with a great recording. So if you can speak just very quickly about the budgets need, needed to create those recordings, because I see across, across my screen here, some people who I know I can see in their minds are thinking, does that mean I need to spend $10,000 on every recording? Or is there a way I can make great recordings with the technology that we have now that will come close to this master quality recording because uh, but I don't have to hire an orchestra. So can you talk a little bit about, um, you know, what you think is required to get to that master quality recording? Yes. Okay. So let's start high. If you are a songwriter and you do not play any instruments and your co-writers don't play any instruments that are usable for recording and you have no studio and you have to go completely outside, you should be able to hire a producer and have a recording that sounds very nice for $2,000. Maybe $1,500 for the instrumentation, a few hundred for the vocals, and maybe $1,800. So around that area. If you're, you can sing on your own recording, maybe $1,500. Is that a lot of money? Look, like I said, when I first started this talk, I waited tables, I cleaned floors, I did everything. Every penny I made went back into my music. It still does. I've spent millions making recordings, right? I ha so I have nothing because my whole world in my air is music. So I'm always paying musicians. So that is the consideration of this gig. This gig is not inexpensive. And my father, a businessman, finds it crazy, of course, that I spend so much money to make money. So, but that is this gig. Now, that's saying you have to hire out everything piecemeal. I am my own producer. I don't have to hire a producer, right? I have my own studio. I don't have to hire a studio, but I'm not a great player. So I do have to hire musicians. So, but I can cut my costs from that $1,800 by hiring musicians. If I can sing myself and don't have to hire a singer, I'm going to save two, $300. But a lot of times I'm not the right vocalist. And we always have to have the right vocalist. We don't want to be singing things that aren't correct for us, right? I don't sound like Beyonce. So if I need someone who sounds like Beyonce, I'm going to have to spend that money to make that recording. If you play instruments and program yourself, then you cannot spend anything and sing. If you are co-writing with somebody who can do the instrumentation and maybe you're providing the vocals and you're providing the melody and lyrics and they're providing more of the production part, you might split it 50-50. You might not be paying any money outside or you might be paying very minimal money outside. So these are ways that you can continue to build your catalog because we all, the more songs we have that are fabulous, the more of service we are to the music supervisors who need go-to people to come to. And like I always say, we have music, they need music. It's a very symbiotic relationship. They want to find new artists, new music, new people. It's not all about working with me. I'm boring. I've been doing this forever. A music supervisor wants to discover you, somebody new. So the playing field is very, very equal, but the songs have to sound amazing. So if you can save money by collaborating, that's awesome. When I write a song all by myself alone, because I like to do that sometimes, it costs me more to make the recording. If I partner with somebody else, it might cost me less. So I does that also, kind of... Yeah, I also think, um, as we all know, it kind of depends on geographically where you're located. I mean, you could cut a, a really awesome sounding track for very little money in a place like Nashville, where it's going to cost you more money in Los Angeles or New York. Not anymore. Um, no, not anymore. I don't believe that. No, I, I know, know what the people are charging in Nashville. And, it and depends on where you, there's a lot of people yeah. that are in Nashville that, you know, for 50 bucks in lunch will come in and they're great players. 
and they'll they'll cut a song for you. I think yeah, it, but they're not cutting a song. They're maybe playing a guitar part. That's not cutting right, a song. Right, that's what I mean. You still have to hire the producer, the studio, and and right. and it depends on the genre because like country music for me costs the most because I've got to hire fiddle players and 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 pedal steel players and additional instruments where that I and banjo players. Whereas on a regular song, I might just hire a keyboard player. You right. know, and it might cost me less. So, you know, yeah. I mean, I don't know anyone who can do a song for fifty dollars. But Susan, if you do, tell everybody who they should contact. I know a lot of people in Nashville that would be happy to come and create a master quality demo for people for very little money. But as with yeah, and remember, we're not making demos. That we should, we need to eliminate the word demo from our right. vocabulary. We are not making demos. We are for sync making pit, making master quality recordings. We are in no way making demos. Demos don't cut it, and we are in no way, you know, making trying to just have a guitar vocal or a singer. And we and we have to get paperwork from these musicians. So if we only pay them fifty dollars, they might not want to give us paperwork saying that it's work for hire and that we own the recordings and we own what they did. So we have to weigh that as well. That can be more expensive, you know, than them just popping over and playing a guitar part for fifty dollars, right? And if we hire one guitar he plays for $50 and the bass player charges $50 and the piano player charges $50 and the singer charges $150, even that's really low and I'm going really low there. By the time we're done, we've spent on the studio charge money, you know, by the hour, $50 an hour. And by the time we're done, Susan, we've accumulated quite a little batch of dollars. So like everything in the music business, the two you know, it's the contacts you have and the musicians and the people that are willing to come in and um, you know work with you on a project for whatever it is you could afford or they're willing to accept. Um, but I, I think the main point is that you must have master quality recordings because it's your one shot and you wanna present your best. So let's move on to actually approaching the music supervisors. What's the best way to do that? Okay, so approaching the music supervisors, once one has all their ducks in a row, they know about the writing, they know about the publishing, they know who owns the master, they have something fantastic to pitch to them, then they need to know how to write a great letter. And what's really important for the basics of a pitch letter is not talking about you. It's talking about them and having some pleasantries because all day long I get letters and I'm not even a music supervisor, but I get letters for people who want me to pitch their songs, which I don't do or help them with whatever. And all they do is write me, hey, can't even say my name. Hey, I'm this, I'm this, I'm that, help me. The other day, someone just sent me a playlist. Then the subject, it said nothing. In the body of the email, it just sent me like 40 links of songs. And they thought that was pitching. And that was optimum. That's not okay. One has to learn to write a letter. So you have to write, hi, Michelle. Thank you for your time. I hope this finds you well. The world is crazy these days, isn't it? Something, right? I went to your website and I saw so many great things about you. And I know, and I love the music you use on Grey's Anatomy. And I also saw, wow, that you had a passion for swimming. I have a passion for swimming. And you want to write something about them that you see. This is the most important thing. First, pleasantries, addressing them by their name and things about them. After you've discussed them, then you can go into I'm a new singer songwriter. I'm so excited to share a new song with you. I'm new at pitching songs, but I really believe in this song. And you want to attach a bio and maybe put your, your links like your Facebook and your LinkedIn and your Instagram and your Twitter and whatever you use on the bottom. And you want to thank them again on the bottom like you thank them on the top. And you want to use links. You never want to send them an email attached in an, in an email with an attachment. They hate attachments. And you really want to learn, which I've just taught all my students how to do, to make a proper email in the platform called Disco, disco.ac, because the music supervisors like Disco. And the whole purpose of us is to serve them. 
It's not for them to serve us. It's for us to serve them. So by serving them, we are sending them a proper disco email that looks beautiful when they receive it. It includes the link to the song inside it. They don't have to fish around for it. And we have given them all the pleasantries. We've included our contact information, super important. And also we are sending MP3s. We're not sending waves or AIFFs. We're sending, not sending MP4s, A's, those things. We're sending MP3s, small MP3s under five megs, between three and five megs, most optimum, so they still sound okay. We are making sure our metadata is filled out, which is like a whole other whole class, Susan, of how to fill out metadata, but the metadata is in your iTunes. We should be sending from iTunes, not housing in our disco, not housing on a desktop, in our iTunes, in the met song information where we can tell, tell them the name of the song, the name of the writers, the name of the publishers, the BPM, what genre it is our contact information, something about the music that says it's up-tempo, happy, fun, yay. You know, it's a female vocal. So we need to provide them with lots and lots of stuff in order to send the song properly. So once we have compiled that information, then we can click send. And in our subject line, we need to address them by their name. So I, I mean, I don't know if Susan and Michelle, you noticed, but I'm always putting your name in the subject line because it's very important when pitching to be personable. We don't just want to put song or song from Michelle. I want to write, hi, Susan, in the subject line. I want to engage you. I want to take the time, even though it takes longer for you to understand that I know you are a human and have a name and I'm sending a song to you and I'm going to personalize my subject line. Okay, so let me ask you a so, question. Um, mm -hmm. Once you get all the protocols down for creating your email and using the disco format because it creates an email and it provides a place for the music, how many songs do you suggest sending under one email? If it's a cold pitch, which I cold pitch all the time and teach my people to, one. Okay, now you might be on a webinar and somebody might say, oh, well, they can send two to three songs. Don't, because I know when people send me songs to review just for coaching, you know, critique, and they send me three songs, I am like, oh crap, when am I gonna find time for three songs? One song, I can always squeeze in one song, right? We're on a webinar, Susan's talking, I can go squeeze in a song. You know, not that I would do that, but I'm just saying that I can always find, you know, minutes to, to one song. But to listen to three songs, that requires more energy, more time. I might not have 20 minutes. So I would, I would suggest one song. If it's not a cold pitch and somebody asks me for songs, I have music supervisors who actually write me and say, I need songs for this. I need a lot of songs for this. Don't send me one song. You know, send me a hundred songs. I need like hundreds of songs for this. I've, I've been asked that as well. But that's different because they're coming to me, they're telling me specifically what they want and I'm trying to serve them from my songs and my catalog. But if I'm cold pitching Susan, I don't know her, I love her work, I love her show, but I don't really know her, I'm only gonna send one song to get the dialogue going. And I'm also, Susan, not going to send them an email beforehand and say, hi Susan, I love that you're working on X Factor, can I send you a song? No, no, because that requires you to answer me twice. You don't want to answer me twice. You're busy. I'm just going to simply send you that disco email and hope you engage in it so, rather than asking your permission first, because I don't want to give you the opportunity to say no to begin with, and I don't want to bother you twice. So I'm not going to write you and ask you, is it okay? So essentially with a cold pitch, um, there's an enormous amount of pressure on one song. So you're saying that one song is the one chance you get to catch their attention. So clearly you have to make sure that you've done all your research, that you're sending them a song that would work for the projects they work on, and that it's a damn freaking great song because you get this one chance to make the impression with one song in hopes that they'll like that. And whether they use it or not is one thing, but if they like your writing, they may come back to you, which is, then your chance to present them with more material. So you have to have a catalog of quality master recordings ready in case they come back to you for more stuff. Exactly, and I, I, in my humble opinion, I tell my people, my students, my people, 
don't pitch until you have some songs. Because if the music supervisor loves what you sent, but that's your only song that's master quality, you're useless to them. They want you to be a go-to for them. They're so excited to meet somebody and love their music and they want you to have more. So we really don't want to be send, sending until we have a nice catalog compiled of songs. So could be if you're an artist, a 10 song album. Could be if you're a songwriter like me, 20 songs, 25 songs, because I'm piecemealing songs. I'm not sending an artist project. So it's really important to always be creating, always be making music. And the most fun part, of course, is the time when you're building your catalog and creating more music. So rather than rushing to be pitching, you should be rushing to keep creating music. Right. And in addition to saving money, as we were discussing before, if you have collaborators, you can churn out more songs because music supervisors don't care if you only have a third of the song, but they care if you have 30 songs as opposed to two songs or three songs. So, so the we, more have you we have a question in the chat um, that mm -hmm. goes right to this subject. Um, uh, the, the question is, is it OK to see the same to send the same song to several music supervisors? I would say yes. Of course it is, if that's your best song, you're not targeting only one music supervisor, you wanna get yourself known to as many music supervisors as possible. So it, yes, it is okay to send the same song out. Yeah, of course, I, I have 2,500, no, now I, there's actually 3,000 music supervisors on my music supervisor email list. Right, so you, you wanna make sure as many of them as possible know who you are. Yeah, um, for sure. Okay. So I'm looking at the time and I, I'm seeing we have about 15 minutes left, so I'd love to okay. get questions from yeah, let's do our it. audience and our participants. And I have not been monitoring the chat, everybody. I'm so sorry because I've been speaking. So, you know, but Susan has, I think. Yeah, I'm monitoring the chat. So Thank I'm, you I'm, so I'm much. gonna jump in these questions for you. Mm -hmm. um, so let's start with, now um, I'm this, is, this is very interesting. We know that we're in a global music market and that hits come from all over the place. And uh, we have, um, uh, artists who sing in multiple languages. The question is, I'm very much interested in sync, um, but I would like to know, um, I do both English and Spanish. Um, what should I be sending out when I'm sending out my music? Should I send an English version and a Spanish version? Is there a uniquely Spanish speaking sync market? Well, that's great. Okay, so Spanish music is, there is a Spanish speaking sync market, Mexico, Spain, Peru, South America, wherever where people speak Spanish, people speak Spanish all over the world. In America, there's many TV shows, movies, films, I have songs in Spanish as well, and I've had them used all over the place. So there's total use for them. You could also make them Spanglish, you know, a combination Spanish, English, you could make versions that are Spanglish, Spanish, and English. And I have success with that. So I would say you never, never know. And with pitches like that, you know, it's possible that once you have created some connections and have some music supervisors that you know and are in your database, you would just send one every so often saying, here's a song to have handy. It's, it's in Spanish. And if you have some scenes where you need Spanish music or Spanglish music, and I'd be, love to be a go-to for you, I have this and do this. I just did two ads in the last two weeks and one of them was in Spanish and one of them was in English. So, you know, they're very useful. And it was for an American company called Rooms to Go, but they wanted a Spanish version of the same ad. Right. So yeah, it's fabulous. And in any language, I have someone in my class who's Turkish, you know, and he can be a go-to for this amazing music he has in Turkish because whenever they need authentic music in Turkish, they're not gonna know what to do, but now he's going to present himself. Right. So it's fabulous. Okay, so on that note, we have another question. Uh, can you please tell me if having an accent in the vocals is going to affect the chances of a song getting a sync placement? Yes, now, now if you're writing this, like I, I write with someone who's Russian and you know her accent is a little put off for some people, yes. So is it better if you're singing in English not to have an accent? Yes, it's better, but that doesn't mean it's impossible. So it depends on the use. If it's a Latin club and the Spanish singing 
is, 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 think, uh, is singing in English and has a little accent, that's normal. That's fine. Because we know like Ricky Ricardo, he's a Latin artist. When he sings in English, he sounds a little Spanish. That's okay. Right. But if it's a general call for they're looking for songs that sound like Katy Perry, but you sound like you're the Kazakhstan version of Katy Perry, that's not useful. That might be a deterrent for them to use the song. So we have to figure out like, what is the use for, right? And how heavy is the accent? So I hired someone from South Africa last year and I really had to drum that accent out of her. It was too heavy mm -hmm. for, the, for the music I was making. You know, she was right. very nice and she complied, but it wasn't easy for her, so. So I, I think, you know, the, 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 the real question is, how is the accent going to affect the song in the master recording overall, right? You know, what are, what are you hoping people to listen, uh, for, for, to, to be listening for? It's most okay. about the use. It's more yeah. about the use. Exactly. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, okay, here is another question. Uh, and this is, this is sort of the aggregate of a lot of questions regarding uh, pitching companies you know, uh, licensing companies that say, give us your music and we'll pitch it for you and get, uh, get syncs for you. What is your feeling about that? Is it even worth one's time to log our songs onto licensing sites or will the submissions or will our submissions never get heard considering the abundance of submissions out there? And that also goes to, should we be, uh, should, uh, creators be aligning themselves with these, you know, music supervisor pitching companies that claim they'll take your music and pitch your music for you. What's your feeling on that? Okay, so that's a very broad question and I'm going to deal with it. So first of all, the most important thing is, are they non-exclusive? We don't want to be doing this with exclusive companies. I don't recommend it. Some people do it. I don't, I only work with exclusive companies if they pay me. So if they come to me and they say, we want 10 songs like Katy Perry and they pay me X amount of dollars and I'm going to give the baby with the bathwater, I'm thrilled to do that. And, but other than that, I want these libraries to be non-exclusive. As long as they're non-exclusive, they're fantastic. And yes, please use them. There are really wonderful ones out there. I've gotten placements for them from them. They're really terrific. The key is metadata. So they're going to ask you, what is your song like? And you're not just going to write, it's fun and happy. You're going to write, it's fun, happy, uplifting, fantastic, incredible, happy day. The more of that information, they're called moods and also called tags. The more of that information you give to a music library like that, those companies, the better your chance of getting a placement is going to be. As for the sites where you pay them to pitch, those suck. So I do not recommend them. The ones that make you pay $5 for a pitch or $10 for a pitch or $100 a year plus $2 per pitch or sign up and pay this. No, these the music libraries that are really great and legit don't do that. They, they do take a piece off the back end, um, meaning your royalties, they do take a percentage of your upfront fees, but they often, often do great work and are great people. And I recommend them very, very much. But of course, here goes to what knowledge we must have. We have to know how to read the contracts. So we have to know and understand the contracts and the contracts are tricky. So, you know, as long as we understand that and they're non-exclusive, then they're super fine. There are sync agents, which I really like, who are individual reps. I have many that I work with and they're non-exclusive and they're wonderful. And they usually take up only percentage of the upfront fee, usually between 25 and 50%, most normally 30% of the fee that's paid upfront. So if the fee is $1,000, they get 300, I get 700. And, and then they don't get any royalties. And they're really wonderful. And there are lots of them to be known who work really hard and you know them personally. It's not like you're just uploading songs to them. You have a relationship with them and you can give them your new songs all the time. And so I love them very, very much. And that's that in a nutshell, very quickly. I hope that helps. Right, so one follow-up question on that. You talk about sync agents, which are in fact, people who act like agents who represent you as the creative talent and, and put your music out there. 
how would one go about getting one? Is that one, is that a situation like getting a record deal where an ANR person would have to seek you out? Or can you just phone them up or email them and say, I'd like you to represent me? How does sure. that? Great. So everything, let's just backtrack and say everything is marketing. Everything we do is marketing, right? If we want our kids to eat their green beans, we're marketing. We're trying to get them to eat it. So the same with finding a sync agent, finding a music library, all of it is research and marketing. So exactly, we don't have to wait for them to come to us, but we would have to do some research on the internet, on LinkedIn, on Facebook, trying to find people who are sync agents, <clears throat> right? So you can Google sync agents, good music sync agents. You can look in that film and TV guide that I mentioned that Rich Ezra puts out and he has sync agents listed in there. Yeah. So there are sync agents all over the place. We want to talk to them. We want to go to their websites. We want to see who they represent, who, what other kind of music they have, what their successes have been just like we would do with any, but well, I do with anyone because I research everything. If I'm going to, before I'm going to talk with somebody, I'm going to go read their bio and read about them and see their website and know what they do, or it's impolite to even talk to them. So that's the same thing with finding a sync agent. You have to make sure your music is really fabulous, that you have enough of a supply of it. If you only have five songs, they're not, not interested in taking you on. If you have 50 songs, they might be very interested and the songs are really well recorded and in genres that they work in. Because if they only work in Christmas songs and you're giving them country pop songs that are not about Christmas, they might not be interested. So. You have to read about them and, and research. Everything is marketing and everything is research. So that's how you find them. And then you hope that they connect, you connect. And, and just <clears throat> based on your own experience, um, <clears throat> if you can, what is the likelihood if you do everything as you suggested that a sync agent, you know, will actually say, sure, I'll be happy to take you on. How often does that really happen in the real world? If well, you have, that's let's a really no difficult track, question. If you have like no track record. It, it, track some, record. Sometimes they don't care. Like I was saying before, they wanna discover something new. It's much more exciting for them to discover you than me. So I, that doesn't matter. What they're really looking for is a great resource for music because they're, they're serving those music supervisors. So, so if you find them and they're nice people, they will have five minutes to take a listen to the song you send and, and discuss with you as long as you know the terminology and understand really what they do. I personally don't think that it's that difficult. They want to find new music. But in terms of percentages, I mean, it's all like marketing. Like I, I find that maybe a half a percent engage in the songs I send and actually stream them and maybe no maybe two percent and then maybe a half percent actually use them so and I'm I'm dealing thousands so the whole thing about marketing and pitching is volume the more people you're pitching to and the more people you're trying to connect with the better opportunity you have to actually make a connection and get an agent get a library to engage with you get you're a music supervisor to engage with you, an a and person, a manager. So it's all about never giving up. But I do believe that for even someone who's brand new, it's it's the same playing field. Yeah, that, that's a really good point. I mean, um, <clears throat> just to sort of, I, I see we're almost out of time, just to sort of close this out. Um, what I take away from what Michelle is talking about is, um, the, the best chance you have of getting your music in sync situations is if you are prepared, if you know the marketplace, if you understand the business side of things. I mean, the most important thing to remember is before you send any of this stuff out, you have to make sure your song is actually copyrighted, right? Send it out, make sure it's copyrighted, make sure you have all the information you need, make sure you have high quality sounding recordings, make sure you treat people the way you'd like to be treated decently, right? You do your homework. And the bottom line is always with everything we talk about um, at She Is The Music and in general in the music industry is that the music has to be great. It really has to be great. And if you, you know, I think as Michelle said, if you have all those things lined up, and you're out there marketing, marketing, marketing yourself and your music, you might have a good chance of getting some placements. 
So just before we go, I actually see there's actually one question for me. There's actually one question yeah. that's for me. So I'm going to address that question as we end today's uh, tonight's um, uh, event, um, because I think it sort of goes to Michelle's initial point when we started this conversation. The question is, do you need a degree in music business if you want to start working in the music industry? Um, and I might be talking myself out of a job here, but the answer to that is no. You do not need a degree in the music industry to work in the music business. However, what you do need is you need to be educated and informed on how this business works. And we all know that you can do that in two ways. You can do that by getting a degree and learning from professionals and academics who study the music industry and, and know all parts of it, or you can do it by joining She Is The Music, signing up for our database and coming to these kind of seminars and learning from professionals like Michelle, um, people who have been doing this, who really understand how this works and keeping your eyes and ears open to gaining as much information as you can about how our industry works. Contrary to popular belief, this is a complex industry um, that's built on a lot of different building blocks. We achieved is the music mentorship, um, want to provide you with information on those building blocks, but that's the best way to start. Get those building blocks, understand how the industry works. And then, as I always like to say, and I say this to my students, always be a good person because you see the same people on the way down as you do on the way up. So uh, that combination of information and being a good person gives you a pretty good platform to launch from. So uh, first of all, I wanna thank, immensely thank Michelle Weiss Maslin for her wealth of knowledge tonight. So kind of virtual and, uh, applause for Michelle. Thank you, um, thank you for having me. She, um, <clears throat> she's amazing as you can see. And um, I think she really nailed it when it came to the basics of sync. Um, as I said, if you are not a member of She Is The Music, please sign up on our website. Uh, and become a member of our database. I'd love to see in our chat all these people connecting. Um, Michelle, do you want to just uh, give a shout out as to where people can contact you? Yeah, okay, so I answer everything. I'm very good at it. So if you write me, I'll answer you. Don't write me a novel, write me something specific. That is something that you're asking. And my email I'm going to put in here, but even so, I'm so easy to find on the internet. So. So that's okay. my email. And, and yeah, way. you're welcome. To, I know most of the people here, so it's really awesome. But anybody's welcome to come say hello. And if I didn't write you back, I didn't get it. I might not be able to answer the question, but I might be. And, um, and fabulous. And also, I give a course, but it's my course is in progress now. So there's nothing to sign up for at the moment. But I'll probably be giving it again in the end of of 2021 maybe like you know November December or maybe beginning of 2022 and I teach a course on holding hands so you know hand holding I mean to really do all this stuff that you do because as you can see we didn't scratch the surface right now and so there's so so much for us to learn and to do to be able to do this correctly and someone's asking my name. My name is Vice Maslin, V I C E M A S L I N. But of course, if you uh, you look just on the flyer from She Is the Music, you're going to see it. Right. So, um, so. And so somebody just asked, how do I sign up for She Is the Music? She Is the Music mm -hmm. uh, is our website. You'll find uh, a way to sign up. You'll find our database there which allows you to connect with literally thousands of female creators, uh, and music executives across the globe. Uh, our next Music Business Basics from She Is The Music Mentorship uh, will be coming along uh, in the next uh, month to six weeks. I hear from uh, a little birdie that it might be about radio promotion. So we're hoping for that, which will definitely be fascinating. I want to thank Michelle again. I want to thank Michelle Arkuski, our uh, program director, who's hiding behind the She's the Music sign, but she makes all of this happen. So love you, Michelle. I also thank you, want Michelle. to thank my She is the Music mentorship committee, especially my absolutely fabulous co-chair, who I would not be able to exist mm -hmm. without. 
Cynthia Sexton, Sarah Bromley, of course, our lovely Melody. Thank you all for joining us tonight. Please keep your eye on our website and on our socials to see what we're up to. We offer all kinds of things all the time. This is a place for women and some men who want to join us to come together and learn about the music business and to support each other. Thank you once again, Michelle. Thank you, everybody, Thank for you. joining. Have a great night. Thank you. Bye.